to halve emissions by 2030 and achieve a net zero world by 2050, the healthcare sector needs to transform. This requires all parts of the healthcare system to work together. As a sector, we're accelerating our race to zero to help build a healthier, safer, more resilient world. Because we know human health is connected to planetary health. I'm delighted to announce that the pharmaceutical and medical technology sectors have achieved a breakthrough in ambition. This means a critical set of companies across our sector are taking robust and ambitious net zero commitments and taking climate action. We are pushing the boundaries of technology to solve climate change and continue to improve the delivery of healthcare across the globe. This extends to all parts of the healthcare system. And through initiatives like the International Leadership Group, which is focused on our supply chain, we're ensuring that all parts of the healthcare system work together. But it doesn't stop here. We're only at the start of transformative change. Because to protect and improve people's health, we need to come together to protect and improve our planet's health. Welcome everybody to this session on the path towards net zero health and healthcare. I'm Jane Burston, the Executive Director of the Clean Air Fund, which is a philanthropic fund aimed at tackling air pollution worldwide. And with the forum, I'm the co-chair of the Global Future Council on Clean Air and a member of the Young Global Leader Community. I hope you enjoyed the video because seeing health and healthcare companies join the commitment to reach net zero by 20, 2050 is an incredibly exciting moment. And everyone on this call who's been a part of that making happen, making that happen should be incredibly proud of themselves. And it's only right that healthcare industry should be leading the way on climate change. Around the world, we already feel the direct and indirect impacts of climate change on health in a variety of ways from more heat waves to the expansion of infectious diseases like, like malaria and Lyme disease. And obviously fossil fuels are both driving the climate crisis and directly harming human health through air pollution, which is causing respiratory, cardiovascular and other non-communicable diseases. So it's unsurprising given this, that the World Health Organization says that climate change is the most significant threat to human health. During this session, we're going to discuss three things. The impact of climate change on health, the impact of the healthcare sector specifically, which accounts for 4% of global emissions, and how the healthcare sector is taking on a leadership role in the transition to net zero. And thirdly, the collective actions of public and private stakeholders in the net zero transformation of the healthcare ecosystem. The format of the session will be four short interventions from our four panelists, which will be on the record. The session is live streamed and open to the general public. So feel free to tweet key insights during the session. And the hashtag is SDIS21. We'll also be taking your questions towards the end of the session, but you can start posting those questions just as soon as our panelists start their interventions. The Q&A function in Zoom is disabled, so we'll be taking questions in Slido. The forum team will be posting the link to that Slido in the chat, so feel free to start using this now. I'm going to turn first to the Honourable Chrissy Kanyesho, uh, the Deputy Minister of Health of Malawi. Deputy Minister, can you tell us about the effects of climate change on health that you're experiencing in Malawi and what your government is doing to tackle this? I can't hear you, Chrissy. I don't know whether uh, others can, but you might be muted. I can't, still can't hear you. Try again now. Can you hear me now? Yes, Can you brilliant. Hear me now? Please go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for having uh, me here and for having Malau here, Madam Chairperson. 
Malawi is uh, uh, characterized on the climate change index as one of the most vulnerable nations to uh, climate change. And it is ranked as the 16th most vulnerable uh, to, to humanitarian uh, crises and disasters. From 1980 to now, Malawi experienced major droughts and floods and more than 600 disaster events recorded since 1946. The floods of 2015, for example, were the worst in the 50 years of recorded data available to that time and were followed by the drought of 2016 and 2017 rain season that affected more than 6.5 million people over a third of the total population of the country. The repeated occurrence of natural disasters contributed to the worsening of people's health status, economic and social welfare. The Ministry of Health is also aware that climate change can influence the diseases burden pattern of some infectious diseases. A climate, climate change sensitive diseases, such as diarrhea, uh, uh, systemosis, uh, behazia, uh, and malaria. For example, in 2019, the cyclone Idai affected mostly two districts in Malawi, Chikwawa and Isanje. This happened soon after we had deployed mosquito bed nets to the whole to the whole country to protect the populations against malaria. Instead of registering a decline in malaria cases like all other districts, Chikwawa district registered an increase in cases, which went over 40%. In this case, the cyclone Idai thwarted the, imp the impact of the mass net distribution campaign and left the people of the two most affected districts unprotected from malaria. The health sector in Malawi is committed to playing its role in the emissions reduction while following a sustainable and resilient health system approach. For example, we plan to buy energy efficient medical equipment. We are also installing solar electricity systems in many of our health facilities instead of installing diesel generators. This way we will reduce the health sector's carbon footprint that's contributing to the carbon emissions targets of the Paris Agreement. It is with, within Malawi's high strategic interest to further engage within the dialogue of the World Economic Forum's sustainable development impact. For, for uh, a national communication strategy on human health and climate change, B, increased capacity building of health workers, as well as community. C, establishment of a multi-sectorial health and climate change core team, uh, just to mention a few. Lastly, uh, Madam Chair, I want to use this opportunity to thank all partners for the support they give to our countries in mitigating the effects of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Minister Kanyesha, for giving us an insight into what you're experiencing and for your leadership on this issue. I'm going to turn next to another leader in the sector, Gonzalo Munoz, um, who's the high level climate action champion for, COP, for the COP um, and who led the race to zero campaign. Um, Gonzalo, when you were bringing businesses into the COP in, in creating the platform that has brought about this announcement that we've heard today, um, what kind of a journey did you go through? Could you tell us a little bit about your journey and about how the healthcare sector has got evolved? Well, thanks so much, Jane. And first, thank you all for, for having me today. It's a real privilege to have the opportunity to speak to all of you on such an important topic alongside these fantastic leaders. Uh, well, as you mentioned, I have the honor of being named one of the two United Nations High Level Climate Action Champions, in my case, appointed by the Chilean government for COP25, working together with my dear friend, 
uh, Nigel Topping as the UK High Level Climate Action Chapter for COP26. We're both of us working together in what was supposed to be an, 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 a year working together, but of course, as you might all know, the, uh, the postponement of COP26 from 2020 to 2021 gave us an extra year and, 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 and that gave us an extra responsibility, uh, mostly in a moment where the COVID pandemic has hit um, uh, the world so hardly. So our role as climate champions uh, is, is to move the ambition and action by what are called the non-state actors in addressing climate change. Non-state actors meaning mostly uh, subnational governments, cities and, and, and regional states, but also, of course, the business sector and the financial institutions. So, so to fulfill our mandate with, with Niger, we launched the Race to Zero campaign back in June 2020. Last year, so no more than uh, one and a half year uh, that we have been running this campaign, but the, the first uh, the first commitment to a net zero world started back in exactly two years ago. So with the, with the Secretary General Summit in, in September 2019, we started putting together all of the effort coming from uh, public and private institutions committing to a net zero and resilient world by 2050 at the latest. So this UN-backed global campaign uh, rallying all non-state actors from across the global economy to take very rigorous and immediate action to first have global emissions by 2030 and reach the net zero by 2050 uh, at, uh, at 2050, sorry, as soon as possible or 2050 at the latest, right? This campaign covers a range of sectors where we aim to deliver a healthier, fairer and more resilient and low carbon world and, and have been growing incredibly during the pandemic. Today, we focus on the healthcare sector to celebrate recent achievements as well as discuss how we can collaborate across our organizations to move from ambition to action. And I would say from ambition to action to advocacy, because at the end, we have an opportunity and an urgency to also embed all of these commitments into the national policies. Planetary health and human health are of course, inextricably linked to each other. And, and, and we know human health is impacted by all sectors of the economy. For example, the energy and transport system play a really critical role in air pollution, which uh, the WHO estimates is accountable for an estimate of 4.2 million deaths per year. However, it is also important to remember that ironically, the healthcare sector is also a key contributor to climate change, being accountable for 4.4% by, by, for of global emissions. Those emissions are all forecasted to grow as healthcare is, of course, of course, one of the largest and fastest growing segments of the world economy. So under a business as usual scenario, emissions would more than triple by 2050. That's responsibility that we have in our hands. As you are all aware, the healthcare sector is complex and only by collaboration and with international organizations. We have seen significant momentum this year. And today we are celebrating the pharmaceutical and medical technology sector reaching a breakthrough in ambition. 28% of the sector by revenue has now joined the race to zero and have set robust and ambitious net zero targets and taking tangible action. With this breakthrough, that 28%, we see the leaders in the sector at the forefront of sustainability, and we call on those who, have, who haven't yet joined to take action and make the same commitments. We encourage collaboration across the sector and with other sectors as well, as we can only win this race working together. So alongside our pharmaceutical and technology campaign, we have also partnered with Healthcare Without Harm on our healthcare system campaign to address healthcare providers. We are really proud to also celebrate their achievements, whereby 40 healthcare institutions representing 3,000 hospitals and health, cent health uh, centers across 18 countries have now joined the Race to Zero. However, of course, it doesn't stop here. We need to continue to push the boundaries on collaboration and innovation to transform the sector. So Jane, thank you again for having me today. I look forward to the panel discussion and the insights from my peers and definitely look forward to have a strong push and a strong commitment from the healthcare sector at COP26 in Glasgow.
Thank you so much, Gonzalo, and huge congratulations for reaching this breakthrough moment. 28% uh, of health and healthcare companies is a fantastic achievement. I hope that if there are companies on the call that have not signed up, that your call to action is, uh, is being heard. And uh, we're going to move now to Nick Watts, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the National Health Service in England, um, and represents the first health system to commit to a concrete net zero target. Nick, what was the background to the NHS committing to this? And can you tell us a little bit about what you're finding easy and what kinds of things you're finding more challenging? Sure, sure. I mean, the background to this probably starts back in 1948. The NHS was founded to deliver high quality care for all now and for future generations. That's why we exist. You can't do that unless you respond to climate change. You just can't do it. Climate change threatens to undermine all of, is currently undermining all of the environmental, the social determinants of health that well-being depends on. Um, we know we're part of the problem. Four, five percent of national emissions, 36 percent of public sector energy consumption, um, roughly the same size as, you know, a medium-sized country, Croatia, Denmark. Um, and we're good healthcare professionals, right? We know that first off, our job is to primum non notre, first do no harm. Um, that's that's the background, right? This is core to everything the NHS does. What really helps is that every year when we go out and we ask our staff, hey, what do you care about? They shout back at us, overwhelming, thunderous. Nine out of 10 staff across the NHS want to see us tackle climate change more and more further and faster. And so that's one of the things we find easy. We're the fifth largest workforce in the entire world, 1.3 million staff, and never once, ever once, do I get asked, are you sure? Should we really? Is this really our core business? Always, everyone is always saying, can we go further? Can we go faster? Come on, let's go, the world is on fire. Um, the hard part is that it hasn't been done before, right? Uh, healthcare professionals, look, we're getting there, but we are traditionally conservative, um, traditionally a little slow to some of these fights, and we have been slow to this fight. We're really picking up pace. But it means that no one has ever developed a net zero healthcare system before. And so we're going to have to figure that out as we go because we don't have time to develop the plan the whole way. And so that looks like new net zero hospital standards and early investment, a quarter of a billion pounds in 2021, 22 into net zero healthcare in the, in the United Kingdom. It looks like the world's first zero emission ambulance. It looks like new qualifying criteria within the decade we mean this and we're very, very serious. Within the decade, the NHS will no longer purchase from any supplier that does not meet or exceed our ambitions. All those sorts of things, right? Trying to figure that out as you go, that's tough. Um, but what makes it really hard is that there are 1.3 million healthcare professionals shouting at us to go further and to go faster, um, keeping up with the pace of change, right? The fact that this is not just positive and possible, but it is inevitable. Um, really hard, really exciting. Thanks, Nick. Um, I mean, that is really super exciting. And um, I was going to ask you a quick follow up question about uh, those staff that are asking you to go further faster. One of the things that um, I've seen in the air quality field, for example, is that it's, it's doctors, it's nurses, it's pediatricians on the front line saying, you know, this is affecting our health. We can tackle both climate change and health at the same time. To what degree are um, those teams also thinking, uh, and to what degree are you also thinking about how to integrate climate work into their practice and, and how they talk about air pollution, for example, with their patients? Yeah, so we're good health professionals, right? Nothing the NHS is ever gonna do as it responds to climate change is going to compromise patient care, quite the opposite, it's gonna improve patient care because we know that all of what we wanna do, it cleans up the air, it makes our cities more livable, encourages physical activity, it makes diets healthier. Um, if you're a good health professional, you're gonna build that into your clinical practice, whether you're thinking about providing uh, remote care closer to home, increasing access for people that traditionally find it difficult to find, find access to a doctor or a nurse, whether you're thinking about the government's national overprescribing review, out today, reckons it can cut unnecessary medications by 10%. It's good for patients. It also helps us tackle the 25% of the NHS's emissions that come from pharmaceuticals, helps us reduce our emissions by around 15% in that branch, right? 
um, yeah, it builds into every part of clinical practice. That is the really exciting thing about doing this with 1.3 million health professionals across the country is every single person has one thing, two things, three things that they personally can access. And that's kind of what gives us the belief um, that we can get there in the end. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, moving now to Christoph Weber, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Christoph, um, you're one of the companies leading the charge on this race to net zero. And I wondered if you could talk us through all of the ways in which the private sector is stepping in here. And um, what advice you would give to other private companies thinking about following suit? Thank you, thank you, Jane. Hi, everyone. Well, you know, Takeda is an R&D driven science based company. So the connection between health and climate change is very established and uh, demonstrated. The connection between human activity and climate change is also demonstrated. So uh, in, in our case, we cannot think to be a health centric company without uh, tackling the, the climate change. And we, we capture that in our, in our mission. Our mission is simple, better health for patients, brighter future for the world. And so that has triggered a, a very huge energy within the company to move faster and to uh, contribute to the fight against uh, climate change. It's not something we do on site. It's really now part of our, of our business and how we think about our activities. And like in the NHS, the, um, the, the energy is very high. I mean, all our employees are extremely committed. and It's, it's very motivating for uh, all our stakeholders, our employees and others to be part of this uh, journey. And you see, an accelerator when you do that you see a clear acceleration of, of what you can do for example we achieved carbon neutrality back in 2020 and we were the first large pharmaceutical company to achieve carbon neutrality and frankly i was surprised myself by the speed of being able to do that and we have now a very clear uh, carbon emission target but not only we are looking at water consumption waste management and other areas where we can contribute to making the planet a more livable planet. Thanks, Christoph. And did I hear you right that you have already achieved carbon neutrality, or that's your target? And if we you already have already achieved it, what's what's the um, how did you get there? If you're if that's your target, what's the plan? What major things do you think you need to do to reach it? Yeah. So we achieve we achieved carbon neutrality in uh, back in 2020 because we we used some carbon offset to offset our carbon emissions. So we did not achieve zero emission. We achieved that in a few years, but we felt that we could achieve carbon neutrality by uh, buying a robust carbon offset. And we felt it was the right thing to do. Uh, and that's the first step. And you know, you need to you need to have this type of milestone to demonstrate that you know it's not only a goal that you have in 2040. In our case, we have a zero carbon emission target in 2040. That's far away, so we need to have milestone, an achievement along the way to uh, to keep the motivation and show that you can progress step by step. Thank you so much, and congratulations for your ambition and leadership. Um, so we're going to move now to the the Q and A part of the session. We've got twenty minutes for that. Um, the forum team has posted the link where you can post your questions into the chat. So I would encourage you to do that. And if you follow that link, you can also vote on other people's questions and move them up or down the list. We've got a few coming in now, so I will start with, with those ones. Um, the first one is climate change, which I'm gonna, gonna direct to the Deputy Minister. Climate change is causing millions of deaths annually. How do you think the healthcare ecosystem could work together to most effectively address climate change? Deputy Minister. And please do unmute. Oh, sorry Ms. about that. Yeah, no worries, we can hear you now, great. Yes, uh, the health sector is affected uh, by uh, climate change. In terms of, uh, uh, let's say, if uh, there is a flood, uh, most of the times what happens is uh, we get very high uh, malaria cases. 
uh, which uh, affects uh, the healthcare system. It's a financial burden on the Minister of Health. And uh, it's very important for the Minister of Health uh, in Malawi, all over the world, to work with the private sector uh, in uh, mitigating uh, factors of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, the best way, like in Malawi, uh, we, uh, we do have uh, uh, electric power uh, challenges. Uh, so instead of using um, uh, uh, diesel uh, uh, generators, we are uh, uh, changing to start using uh, solar, uh, uh, solar power. So that's another way uh, in helping as a government uh, in mitigating uh, 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 climate change. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Did any of the other panelists have anything to say on the, the working together, how will the ecosystem complement one another and what kind of public-private partnerships could be forged? If not, happy to move to the next question. Um, there's a couple of linked questions here about the, uh, the climate change conference coming up in Glasgow. So um, I'll throw this out to those of you who want to, to pick up different elements of it. What role will the climate conference in Glasgow play in advancing real action? And I'm gonna add on another question that's Can come in. What's your ambition? That's uh, th no, that's that's to one of the other panelists. Mm -hmm. And what's your ambition for the COP? And I'll go first to uh, Christoph and then come to Gonzalez. I think uh, you know uh, Glasgow is important to accelerate the movement. Um, uh, Gonzalo said it: uh, twenty-eight percent of the company uh, in the pharmaceutical space have, have engaged. It's it's. It's both a success, but there are still, uh, you know, a lot we have not. So I think we need we need an acceleration. Otherwise, we will not achieve the uh, the 1.5 degrees uh, cap that we are all aiming for. I mean, um, so we, we have a line. Of, for example, our target to this 1.5 degrees, but we know it's it's slipping away. So what we need is uh, is very it's a it's a very significant acceleration to achieve that goal. So Thanks, if I can Christoph. add to I'm what Christoph just mentioned, um, th definitely there are several agendas that are getting combined. And, and, and of course, one very critical agenda that is totally related to the healthcare system is about how can we learn from the COVID crisis in terms of deploying the solidarity that is needed to solve global crises like the ones that we're talking about COVID and climate in a way that is really effective and efficient, but also taking into account all of those uh, regions and, and groups of the population that are suffering the most. So that, that element is really, is, is really important now, even thinking about the few weeks that we have uh, uh, ahead of, uh, of, 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 I mean, from now to, to, to Glasgow. Then when it comes to Glasgow, we think about mostly four big elements. There's one element that is related to, as Christoph said, keeping the 1.5 alive. In order to keep the 1.5 alive, we need more and more actors of the global economy committing to a net zero world, showing what they are doing and showing how they are in now not only committing, but implementing the actions that, is, is, uh, that will take a not, not only to a net zero world by 2050, but to reduce and have our emissions in this decade. Okay, we're talking about 7.4% of, of uh, emissions reduction year by year from now to 2030. That is a massive task in order to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. And I really expect, and this is something that we were working with Niger very strongly and with a fantastic team, putting together now 15 sectors of the global economy reaching the breakthrough point where we know that we have in the, in, uh, like, like the pharmaceutical sector, more than 20% of the major actors of that sector of the economy now committed to, to, to raise to zero and the net zero world. Then we need to build resilience. And then we need to develop the finance. And when it comes to finance, we now have $90 trillion already committed to the net zero path. That topic, is not only important by itself. 
if we go back two years ago, we had only $2 trillion. So in less than two years, we've reached a massive tipping point in terms of knowing that, the, that there would be, and it's already happening, a massive flow of private uh, capital moving towards the net zero world. And the fourth big element is collaboration. It's about strengthening the multilateralism, but uh, allowing the multilateralism to work in a way that is incorporating new stakeholders like the private sector or the subnational governments. That uh, message of moving from the negotiation part of it that is so important to one that is a lot about implementing and offering the capacity of partnering between the public and the private sector, I think is absolutely crucial. And I'm sure that we will see a lot of that at COP in Glasgow. Thank you, Gonzalez. I hope that we do. Um, coming now to Nick with a question about supply chains. Um, supply chains and capital purchases are the greatest source of healthcare scope three emissions. And the question is, how can healthcare um, work with the supply chain to reach net zero emissions? Um, so if you want to unmute yourself, Nick, and take that one. Sure. Um, maybe first by disagreeing with the question slightly, um, or, or maybe explaining some of the nuance behind the numbers. If you go and look at our diagrams, we confuse you. Our fault, I apologise. It looks like 66% of our emissions are in the supply chain. They sort of are. Um, they're in scope three, right? And that's a way of providing some international comparison. But to explain what that is, those are the emissions from the food that we consume within hospitals. They are the emissions from the scalpels and the mobility aids, from the pharmaceuticals, from the plastics that you know come, come and protect all of the drugs and the tech around it. What I'm getting at is, if you think it's all supply chain, you disempower yourself. The NHS has agency, healthcare professionals have agency over that. We decide what goes on the menus within our hospitals and our clinics. We decide what drugs we prescribe. We decide how our recycling systems work for those mobility aids. Um, and so we have an ability to act on all of those. We are not powerless within that supply chain. Nonetheless, our partners and our friends that supply the NHS and healthcare systems around the world are critical. I've said quite a few times, the NHS, no healthcare system can get to net zero unless everyone gets there. We can't do it alone. We have to do it with our partners, with our suppliers. The good thing is they're there with us. The good thing is they are moving faster as we've heard from Gonzalo. There is an enormous amount of pace here. Some of this stuff is gonna be easy. Some of this stuff other industries are working on and we're gonna benefit from some learning there. Some of this stuff, uh, we're gonna to have to do our own innovation. We have um, five or six uh, fairly large innovation uh, competitions out and coming out into the system across the country, across the world, um, looking to figure out some of those tough to reach areas. Some of the stuff we don't know much about, um, but what we're going to have to do is set a target. We're going to have to make it look big and scary. Um, uh, and we're going to have to demonstrate we're very serious about it, set some qualifying criteria for what it means to contract with the NHS. You can't contract with us unless you're aligned with our net zero commitments. Um, that's going to drive some of that innovation. When we run into some of the difficult parts there, that's okay because our suppliers, our partners, they have a, a friendly welcome uh, partner there to figure out some of those questions with us. I, I think most importantly, we have to be focused steadfast on the long-term ambition. We have to set some near-term milestones and we have to be okay with the fact that we don't have the answers to everything, but we know we're going to get there together. Thank you. Well, I'll look forward to uh, keeping an eye out for those innovation competitions and hearing more about those mega targets. Um, now, we've got a couple of uh, questions come in about the pandemic, um, and I'm going to turn to the Deputy Minister for the first and then to Christoph for the second. Um, the first is, in light of the pandemic, how can we build back our health systems and the populations that they serve in a healthier and greener way. And for Christoph, um, a question about whether and how the pandemic has affected your sustainability plans. Um, so coming first though to the Deputy Minister. And I think you just maybe need to unmute first, please. Yeah, sorry. Perfect. I think the question, um, if I got the question uh, correctly, it says, uh, 
how can we build back our health systems uh, in light of uh, the pandemic? Exactly. To, okay, what else? Am I missing um, something else? To, ser to, serve the, to serve the population in a healthier and greener way. Yes, okay. Well, I'll, I'll be specific about Malawi because that's my experience. Uh, the, of course, the pandemic has been uh, terrible but it, it has uh, jolted our government into action. For example, uh, now we were, our doctors and nurses or the, uh, the health workers, they were, very, we were, they were very low in numbers, but because of the pandemic, the government was forced to recruit more doctors, more nurses, more clinicians, more uh, uh, lab technicians, and uh, uh, in conjunction with our uh, developmental partners, uh, that is uh, uh, the Western world, and uh, uh, yeah, the Western world, which includes America anyway. Uh, they came in in full force uh, to help us uh, stabilize our health system. So in a way, uh, it's been bad, but in a way, there's some positives that we've learned, uh, we've been forced uh, into action to improve our healthcare systems. Uh, we've, we, for example, uh, we've uh, built uh, more new clinics. Uh, we did not have uh, places, let's say, in, we, we had built, um, uh, what do we call isolation centers, getting mm -hmm. ready for e Ebola. But likely enough, Malawi has never had a single case of Ebola. So those places were just uh, getting dilapidated. But with this pandemic, they have been uh, revamped and we've built so many more isolation centers everywhere, modern technology. So in a way, uh, it's been bad, but it's also been a blessing in this guy, so to speak. Thank you, Deputy Minister Kenyasho. And um, Christoph, has the pandemic affected your sustainability plans? And if so, how? Yeah, it, has, it has had a, a very significant uh, impact, uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. On the positive side, in fact, it has accelerated our carbon emission reduction uh, because we, we shifted many of our activities into virtual, digital. And in fact, uh, our footprint, uh, our carbon footprint has uh, has reduced uh, further. Uh, that's on, on, the, on the positive. On, on the negative, you know, the pandemic has highlighted healthcare system deficiencies, uh, inequities, um, and uh, you know we, we are treating a very uh, severe disease with our medicines, and we have seen the disruption that has happened in the healthcare systems. And we don't talk a lot about that, but uh, there is. A, the, the direct impact of the pandemic of the virus on the mortality, but there is an indirect mortality impact of the pandemic. And, and I think this is something that we have seen in our, in our, in our activities. And then we have seen the pandemic uh, disrupting our supply chain uh, because of the non-coordination and the inability or the unpreparedness of the world to uh, agree and to coordinate ourselves. Uh, so, you know, so we, luckily not, we have been able to maintain our, the integrity of our supply chain, but it was very, very tight. And we know that there has been broader issues within the pharmaceutical industry. So I will say that, um, you know, we cannot connect the pandemic that is happening right now with climate change, but we can, uh, we can connect the pandemic with increased population, climate change. So what it means is that we'll have more pandemic coming. So, you know, we'd better be more prepared in the future because we shouldn't think that, okay, we have had this pandemic and the next, uh, the next one will come in 50 years. That would be a very, very wrong assumption and big mistake. So we, we should learn now from what happened and be better prepared for the next one. Yes, that's a very good point. That it's not—it's not just about the direct impact on emissions or on air pollution during the lockdown period. 
Uh, it's about the narrative and what people understand the effects that and the health effects of climate change are likely to be in the future and how seriously they take those. Um, we haven't spoken yet about the role of healthcare professionals themselves as advocates for doing more and championing action on climate change. Um, but it's something that I see quite a lot. And um, Gonzalo earlier in the conversation mentioned the, the NGO Healthcare Without Harm. And I know that's something that they work with uh, hospitals and doctors on is, and nurses and all kinds of healthcare professionals, how they themselves can advocate for greater change from governments and from businesses in their position as medical professionals. I wondered if any of you have a comment about uh, what you have seen healthcare professionals doing so far, what you think um, could be done more and, and how we could support those uh, NGOs and healthcare professionals in their position. Gonzalo will take that one, thank you. Sure, yeah, thank you, Jane, because it's so much related to a cultural shift, right? And we're seeing that paradigm shift in, in all of the sectors of the economy and some of them with them very concrete capacity and influence on changing the global narrative and changing the way we behave. In that sense, part of what we're doing in Race to Zero is working with uh, educational institutions all around the world. We have now more than 660 universities that have committed to Race to Zero. And in that case, it's not only about their operation, it's not only about whether they buy the, uh, the electricity coming from renewable or they set uh, bike lanes and, 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 and prepare the campus for being greener is so much about the curriculum. And, and in that sense, we're seeing the importance of not only embedding this topic into the curricula and therefore training the professional in the healthcare system in a way that they can understand the capacity of influencing, uh, but also uh, connecting that to a topic that is also extremely important is the use of talent. We are now no, we're now noticing that many of the uh, leader institutions in every sector of the economy are changing due to their need of connecting to their talent in a way that is, is connecting these values and this agenda everywhere in the organization. So we see that happening and definitely uh, there, there is a change coming from universities all around the world in terms of connecting climate everywhere in, 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 in on how people are getting trained. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think those points about curriculum development are very well taken. Um, it's it's hard, a hard thing to do and very long-term effects, but absolutely essential for this, for this change. Um, so I'm afraid to report that we've come to the end of our session. That was incredibly stimulating and I'm in, so excited to see all of the work that's being done in the healthcare sector on this topic. Um, if you're in the audience from a healthcare company, do consider joining the Race to Zero. Um, the forum team are gonna paste a link in the chat to the website that you can go and find out more about what the commitments in, uh, entail and get in touch with the team. There's also um, at the World Economic Forum, a CEO climate leaders group, which you can join. And I think the forum team will post a link to that in the chat as well. And if you're specifically interested in air quality, the forum has brewing on that as well. Um, so please do take action on the back of this call, reach out to any of the panelists if you have further questions. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of the panelists for your leadership in this area and for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you.